The interest rate swap is by far the most common over-the-counter derivative. Here, I would like to illustrate the mechanics of what's called a plain vanilla interest rate swap, introduce some of the key terms or terminology associated with the swap, terms like notional, netting, and tenor, and then highlight two of the key features, including that interest coupons are paid in arrears and there is not a swap of the notional. My example here follows John Hull's example in his chapter seven, where we illustrate a plain vanilla interest rate swap. We call it plain vanilla to distinguish among all of the other variations of the swap, and there are many variations. In this plain vanilla interest rate swap, Citigroup is what's called the floating rate payer. So Citigroup has agreed to pay a floating rate and it's going to reference here still the most common, which is LIBOR, London Interbank Offered Rate. That is an unsecured borrowing rate between banks, generally rated double A. LIBOR itself runs from one day to one year, although very common for the interest plain vanilla interest rate swap is to swap payments every six months and therefore reference a six-month LIBOR. So LIBOR did experience a scandal in 2012. So we're in the, now we're in the long wake of some controversy over LIBOR and perhaps it's eventual replacement, but still very popular in this plain vanilla interest rate swap. Apple is the counterparty who we could call the fixed rate payer because they are agreeing to pay a fixed rate so it won't change over the term of the swap, and in this case, it's going to be 3%. So very simple illustration of the swap. Two things I haven't, that I'm not illustrating specifically are that the swap will have a term, and we're going to illustrate a three-year term for the swap. That's the length of the contract during which they will swap these interest rate payments. This could also be called the life and it could also be called the tenor if we want to be real fancy. The other thing that I haven't shown is the notional. So what is the notional amount that is referenced by these interest rate payments? After all, we have to know 3% of what? And this notional can also be called the notional principle, although I prefer just notional. So before showing you the numbers, let's just address one of the motivations illustrated by Hull. And this motivation is called transforming the liability or transformation of the liability. So here we have the same arrangement. Citigroup is the floating rate payer. Apple is the counterparty who is the fixed rate payer. And Citigroup, now we just imagine that before entering into the swap, we imagine that Citigroup is out in external markets borrowing at a fixed rate of 3.1%. So that's their underlying fixed rate obligation. Then they, enter, then they separately enter into this over-the-counter derivative, this swap, and then we look at their net profile. And you can, that, that's where these diagrams come in handy because you can just visualize this 3% fixed that it's getting from the swap flows almost entirely through to the 3.1% funds almost all of this except for 10 basis points so that the two positions combined achieve for Citigroup a net floating rate of LIBOR plus this 10 basis point difference. And that's a transforming a liability because Citigroup had a fixed rate obligation of 3.1%. Now with the swap, they're looking at paying a floating rate of LIBOR plus 10 basis points, transforming the fixed rate obligation into a floating rate. Similarly, we can imagine Apple if their underlying borrowing in external markets was at a floating LIBOR plus 10 basis points, this swap from their perspective, you can see LIBOR really flows through and funds all of this except for 10 basis points. And Apple's net position is the three, the fixed rate of 3% that it pays in the swap plus this 10 basis points. And similarly, we could say Apple has transformed a floating rate obligation or liability into a net fixed rate. So that's one of the motivations for the swap. The other realistic complication that I would just add 
is the financial institution or intermediary. So there's the only difference here is now we've in, we've inserted a in, an institution. After all, it's unlikely that Citigroup and Apple will directly uh, trade with each other on this swap. Rather, a financial institution will step in and perform this service. And in my illustration, they're going to charge four basis points, four basis points per annum for this swap service. And so I achieve that now just by creating the spread here. Apple, instead of 3% fixed, is paying 3.02%. And Citigroup, instead of receiving 3%, is receiving 2.98%. So you can see the spread there is four basis points per annum collected by the financial institution or the intermediary as for the service. And you can see that increases Citigroup's and Apple's um, borrowing, in this case, each by two basis points. So then finally, I just look at the cash flows as reflected in holes or as I've replicated from holes. Table 7.2, I might have added one column. And now we can explicate some of these assumptions. And then I do want to stress two points, especially for CFA or FRM exam candidates. Right, so in terms of my assumptions, now I finally inserted or formalized that the notional or AKA notional principle is 100 million and that the fixed rate payers agreeing to pay 3%. The cash flows here are from the perspective of Apple who has agreed to pay this fixed rate. So now we can see the chronology reflects six month, what I think of as coupon periods and for a total tenor or life or term of the swap of three years. And in this uh, assumption here, Apple and Citigroup initiated the swap in March of 2017. I'm matching John Hall chapter seven again. And the LIBOR, the six month LIBOR at that time just happens to be 2.20%. So let's, let's make the first point, And that is that in this plain vanilla interest rate swap, at swap inception, there is no exchange of the notional principle, the 100 million. After all, they would just be trading 100 million between each other. Similarly, though, at the end, in the plain vanilla interest rate swap, unlike in the currency swap, there will also be no exchange of the notional principle. That's the one first point that I wanted to stress as a feature of the swap for exam candidates. No exchange of the notional principle if it's a plain vanilla interest rate swap, there is no need for it. Okay, then let's get to the second point, and that is, so the swap was initiated and nothing, no cash changed hands, although LIBOR, six-month LIBOR is 2.2%. Then we go forward now, six months in time from March 2017 to September 2017, going forward to the end of the first period. I think I added that column. And in the meantime, I'm following John Hall's simulation of possible LIBOR, right? These are in yellow because they could, they could simulate out in various paths. But in this simulation, LIBOR increased, looks like by 60 basis points to 2.8%. Again, six month LIBOR. Go forward six months. The new six month LIBOR at September, at the end of the first period is 2.8%. And now we can make the second point, and that is that end of the at the end of the first period, what determines the interest rate for the floating rate payer is the rate that prevailed at the beginning of the period. So you can think of this as in arrears, as interest being paid in arrears. At swap inception, six-month LIBOR was 2.20%. That is the rate that determines the floating rate obligation six months later at the end of that first period. So that's why here, September 2017, Apple, who's receiving that floating payment, is receiving $1.1 million because it is the 2.20%. I'm going to take this $1 million out here. It's the 2.20% times the 100 million, but we're doing this semi-annually, right? So we need to remember to divide by two. 
and that equals the 1.1 million paid by the floating rate payer. So the 1.1. Similarly, if we go forward to the end of the second period, now we're at March 2018 here. That's one year after inception. Let we imagine or we simulate that six-month LIBOR has increased again to 3.3%. However, at the end of one year, what determines that floating rate payment? It was the 2.8% that was six-month LIBOR six months previously, which was six months after the swap started. So in that case, at the end of year one, it's the 2.8% multiplied by the notional of 100 million, divided by two because it's semi-annually. So that was my second point, is that basically for the floating rate pair here, we are in arrears. Interest rate is determined at the beginning of the period, six month period and paid at the end of the six month period. That's why, another way to think about that or to reinforce this is to realize that at inception, in this case, March, 2017, we already know what the swap will be six months later, because we know the fixed rate always, in this case, one and a half million, and we're going to know the floating rate payment six months later. And so as part of that, you'll notice that we have the netting concept. Netting is an important concept in risk reduction. This is one variation of netting. If Apple is going to pay 1.5, but receive 1.1, they might as well net that and in this case, Apple is going to end up paying 0.4 million or 400,000. So the netting concept is important here. And you can see the netting goes all the way through to the end of the simulation. And again, no exchange of the notional at the end of the swap. So that summarizes the general feature of the interest rate swap. In the next video, we'll look at a uh, comparative advantage that associates with the swap. If you found this video helpful, subscribe to the channel and you'll get notified of our uh, notified when we make new videos. Thank you.